Good afternoon, everybody, if you're joining us from uh, the Eastern time zone, and uh, welcome. And I think we shall get started, though I believe we have a number of people joining us, and there are probably even more to come. I'd like to wait a minute more if I can. I'm Martha Martin, your host. I'll just give people a little bit more time to join in. Yeah, I think I'm going to get started. And... Uh, Hi to Julia. I see some people are joining in and, and saying hello uh, in the chat. That's awesome. So hi, everybody. My name is Martha Martin, and I'm your host for today's virtual launch of The Club by Eric Walters. Before we get started, I know we're all joining today from different parts of the world, but we still want to acknowledge that wherever we are joining in Turtle Island, we are standing on lands that are the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. We always want to look for ways we can take meaningful action on a personal level on the path to reconciliation. And uh, I also want to invite you as our guests to post any questions you might have in the Q&A section of the webinar as we move forward to, for the pre through the presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, teachers, you can definitely post questions for your students. That Q&A is the place to do it. We're hoping to get to questions and answers at the end of our launch. And we'd also love it if any participants can put in the chat the name of their school and their town, and it would be even better if you could tell us how many people are joining us from your location today. We just think that would be really fun to find out where everybody's uh, coming from. So now most of you are already familiar with the writing genius of Eric Walters, but I thought it might be fun to introduce him to you with some trivia about him. So first, did you know that Eric has been given the Order of Canada and the Governor General's Award, as well as about a bazillion other uh, writing honors and uh, awards for his work? He has five grandchildren. He and two friends created an organization in Kakima, Kenya to help orphan children. And now that charity helps not only children in that community, but the entire community as well. It is called Hope Story and you can find out about it online. He started writing for kids at the age of 36, but we like to joke around that he actually started writing when he was 10 because his grade five teacher at that age told him that he was gonna be a writer when he grew up and that he could make a living at it. He's a first rate paddleboarder, doesn't fall off, unless of course he wants to. He was, sorry, he's been married to the same fabulous, gorgeous, wonderful woman for 40 years. He was once photographed on Google Earth walking his dog and the club is his 135th published book. I'm so proud to say he's been my friend since 2008, and I'd like to introduce you today to Eric Walters. Thank you very much, Martha. Let's see if we're gonna make this work. Come on. Oh, there we go in and out. You know, I have done probably 12,000 presentations and over 250 webinars and another 400 virtual visits. One of the difference between the virtual visits and the real visits is never in a real visit have I suddenly disappeared, ran from the room, muted my own voice, or lost connections. So hopefully now those things will happen today. I'm going to, uh, oh, uh, slight quiz. How much money do you think I had to pay Martha to put, have her put in the line, my writing genius? Um, we should probably give a free book away if the person that guesses that correctly. I'm going to go directly into the slideshow because I like slideshows a lot. Here we go. We're going to talk, obviously, about the club. That's what this is about. But I'm going to talk about Made for You as well. I've written a lot of books, a whole lot of books. These books are different types. There's um, board books, uh, picture books. And it's interesting since I've had my grandchildren, my picture books have become more playful. Um, first chapter books. And high lows, the orca signs and currents. If you have a book report during a few days and you forgot it, this is one of the books you might want to get. 
and of course the novels. My books are now available in 16 different languages. They're, they're available around the world. I've won about 150 awards. A couple of years ago, I won the Governor General's Award. And with COVID and all, I'm actually going to Ottawa uh, next Wednesday for reception to receive the Governor General's Award. The last time I was at the Governor General's um, home residence, we were all supposed to wear tuxes. I wore a tuxedo and realized I looked identical to the serving staff. I wasn't sure whether I should give out drinks or accept the award. My favorite awards are, of course, the Children's Choice Awards. And um, I've had the great fortune of winning 10 Forced of Reading Awards in Ontario. Uh, the latest one was Bear in the Family. These awards mean so much to me. Win or lose, kids get to make the choices. That means so much. I've also lost the biggest book award in the world. It's called the ALMA. This is the Nobel Prize of Children's Literature awarded once a year out of Sweden. No Canadian has ever won this award. I kept that streak alive by losing. I feel sort of like the Toronto Maple Leafs. Where did my writing start? I was a teacher. I was teaching at this school, Vista Heights Public School, and they did something interesting. They gave me 28 students of which 22 were boys. My class was good at three things, gym, recess, lunch. They didn't like to read, they didn't like to write. They were pretty good at making up stories, but that was mainly when they were trying to convince the vice principal not to suspend them again. I wanted them to stop making up stories and start writing them. We were studying local community, but no one had ever written a novel about Streetsville before. No one had written a novel about Mississauga before. I wrote one for my class. It's called Stand Your Ground. The school in there is called Vista Heights Public School. That's where I was teaching. It's set in Streetsville. There's both a soccer and a chess theme in this book, because those are two of my favorite sports, by the way. And for those of you who don't think chess is a sport, uh, you haven't played it the right way. The water tower on the cover, that sat behind our school, and kids used to go behind that water tower and have fist fights. That happens in the story, too. And six of the kids in this story are kids from my class. I wrote this for my class. End of the year, the boys came up to me and said, you know, Mr. Walters, your book, it's better than most of the garbage we're forced to read. That was a compliment. Why don't you try and get published? I sent it off to six publishers. Five rejected me. One accepted me. I've written a book, but I'm not a writer. I'm a teacher. First day of school, the next year, the kids said to me, what are you going to write about this year, Mr. Walters? Maybe I was both. I continued to write my first 25 books, published books, while I was teaching. They were based on the curriculum, quite often, depending on the grade that I was teaching. I want to talk about the first book I ever did with, with Dancing Cat uh, called Made for You. My main character, she lives in this community, a small town. She goes to this school. The guidance counselor and the principal come to her and say, there's a new student coming in. Could you be his host? Could you show him around? She says, of course. She's a really nice kid. She just wants to help, but she also knows it'll look good on resumes that she's helping. The new kid shows up. His name is Gene Newman. He's dressed in a bright, bright blue suit. He has a shiny briefcase and even shinier shoes. It turns out that he's not just new to their school. He's never been in school before. He has one interesting character. He seems to know everything about some things and nothing about some things. He follows around all day like a puppy dog. All she wants at the end of the day is to be left alone. She says, I I'm sorry, i got to go to band practice now. He says, can I be in the band? She says, I didn't know you played an instrument. What do you play? He says to her, what do you like? Well, saxophone. That's what I play. I play the saxophone. She doesn't believe him. Three days later, she show, he shows up at, at the audition. He is the best saxophone player anyone's ever heard. She's the manager of the boys' basketball team. He says, can I be on the basketball team? She says, well, anyone can try out for the team. Um, but she wants to start me as a basketball person. He says, she says, what, what team do you like? He says, all of them. Um, who's your favorite player? Michael Jackson? Not Michael Jordan? He's good, right? He tries up the team. He is amazing. In your brain are neurons that help you think. That thought becomes action through connective material. Those tissues, if they're covered with something, sheathed with something called myelin, they fire 20 times as fast. It's called miracle myelin. If you looked at an MRI, that's what it would look like, the white stuff. Dogs have 20% myelin. Chimpanzees, 40%. Humans, about 60%. This kid, Gene Newman, 90%. He is more sm smarter than us than we are compared to chimpanzees. He's like a new species. What happens to us if this new species emerges? 
We're just house plants. Some men in black show up. They want to find out what's inside his head. And maybe the only way to do it is to cut open the top of his head. The book is called Made for You. The Club. I'm so happy to be talking about this book. It's such a joyful book to write. Oh, no, we've got another band, apparently. That's a theme. By the way, I was in the school band. I played the trombone back then. My main character's name is Jackson. He's a trumpet player. He is the best trumpet player in the school. Actually, he's the best musician in the school by far, and he knows it. A new girl comes, wants to join the band. She plays the trumpet. She has the most expensive brand of trumpet you can get, and she's good, really good, maybe better than him, actually. It's hard for him to admit that. The music teacher, Miss Hooper, decides to build around these two very talented musicians. They'll be featured in all their concerts. They'll perform duets at school assemblies. Members of the band, including them, will play at school games. See, there's a danger going on. The band program might be canceled. This is the year to show the value of the program to the entire school. One of the songs they do as a duet is Circle of Life, and you'll see that has some significance in this story and for this webinar. These two have a lot of things in common. They play the trumpet. They are incredibly good musicians. They love music, including old records, vinyl, and jazz music. They're only children. They're in single-parent families, and those single-parent families are mother-led. People joke that they even look alike. They talk alike, and they have something else in common. And I'm going to do a short reading from the book. There was a tap on the door. It opened, and my mother and Liv's mother came in. How are you doing? To doing, my mother asked. Really good, Liv said. Didn't you hear us playing? Yes, it was very good, my mother replied. She sat down on the edge of my bed. Jax, could you sit down here beside me, please? Liv was already perched against my desk, and her mother went to her, sat down, and took her hand. Both moms looked so serious. What's going on? I asked anxiously. Jen and I have had a long conversation, my mom said, and we need to share something with both of you. They looked at each other, and my level of anxiety rose even higher. My mother took a deep breath. We really don't know for certain, but we believe there's a possibility that the two of you might be brother and sister. What did you say, I asked? What are you talking about? Liv blurted out. Liv, I know this is hard to hear, but I don't care about it being hard to hear. I just want to know what you're talking about. There's no way we're brother and sister. You're right, my mom said. I misspoke. I felt a rush of relief. There's a real possibility that you're half brother and half sister. Of course, I'm Jack's mother and Jen is your mother, Liv, but you two might have the same father. I felt like I'd been kicked in the guts like I was having an out-of-body experience. My mom was my mother, but I'd never met my father. Neither had my mom. He was a donor parent. She'd selected his sperm from a catalog of donors. I made the same decision as your mother, Liv's mother said. We were both single and wanted to have a baby and didn't have a partner. We both selected the person we thought would provide the best genes. I looked at Liv. Her stunned expression matched how I felt. Did our expressions match because she was my half-sister or shared the same donor father? Look, just because we're conceived the same way doesn't mean we're related, Liv said. Yeah, what she said, I mumbled. Lots of people will like us, right? Tens of thousands of babies are conceived with a donor each year in this country, Liv's mother replied. So the odds are way against us being related, I replied. Lots of people have donor fathers. It's more that you both have having donor fathers, my mother said. We agree. We sort of look alike, Liv said. But lots of people look the same. And lots of people play the trumpet, I added. I'm not related to Louis Armstrong or Miles Davis, Liv said. He plays the trumpet. I just have a feeling, my mom said. You have lots of feelings about lots of things. This isn't proof of anything, I protested. We don't have proof, but we do have logic, Liv's mother said. I showed your mother the donor information about Liv's father. She held up her phone. You have it on your phone, Liv questioned. I have access to all my files and information on my phone. And the things Jed, Jen read off all sounded very similar to what I know about your father, my mom said to me. All the things I told you about his background, well, all the things I could remember. Did you compare the file on him you were given, I asked. My mom looked embarrassed. You know, I'm not the most organized person. As in, you don't know where it is? I don't know exactly where it is, but on the bright side, you know I'd never throw anything away, she said and beamed. Don't you think she'd find it before she start talking to us about this sort of thing, I demanded. He's right, there's no point in scaring us, or... Liv turned to me. 
not that being related to you is scary. It's just so, so strange, weird, unexpected, bizarre, I asked. Yes, yes, yes. And maybe yes again, Lip said. And I'm going to go back to the slideshow. If they have the same father, they have the same DNA. You see, the information wasn't given the name of the donor at that time. You just were given this information. You're going to have to do DNA testing. It used to be very rare to do DNA testing. Now it's not so rare. Can a DNA test be wrong? Well, I want you to think of it this way. Flip a coin, it lands heads. Flip a coin a second time, it lands heads. A third time it lands heads. A fourth time it lands heads. A fifth time it lands heads. A sixth time. And do this 23 million times. And each time it lands heads. That's the odds of two DNA tests being identical without the people being related. It's impossible. Actually, you know, identical twins, they don't even have the same DNA. But they have enough that you know they're identical twins. You know they're siblings. Liv and Jackson, they're half brother and half sister. They're half siblings. They do share the same donor father. But that father's unknown to them. You didn't get the name. What you got was called non-identifiable information. That included appearance, possibly education level, his occupation, what he did for a living, hobbies and interests, age, maybe the city where he was born or raised or still lived at that point. But now DNA testing has become incredibly common. My kids gave me a DNA test for one of my birthdays. Anybody I'm related to who was on there, besides getting my information about my particular background, they connect me to people who are related to me. They get a match on their DNA testing. Obviously, they're saying they have a few relatives. Their mothers, that's one. Each other, that's half siblings, that's a second. But they're also given information to say they have a probable aunt. Now, neither of their mothers have a sister. This probable aunt has to be the sister of their father. They know that. They're given information about her. They do a Google search and find out about who she is. You can find out anything on Google, it seems, when you search. They also find out she has two brothers. One of those brothers is an engineer. The non-identifiable information they were given about their donor father was he's an engineer. They know who their father is. They know his name. They find out further search where he lives. The New York Times wrote that anonymous donation doesn't exist anymore. Through all of these common connections, people are going to be able to find those missing people. They find out, though, it's not just two of them, not three or four or five. There's 12 of them. They're part of 12 brothers, half brothers, and half sisters. Liv really wants to find out more. Jackson isn't so sure. He wants to know anything more. What he knows, though, is if that's what Liv wants to do, he wants to do it too. They decide they want to meet all the other half-siblings. They want to discover who else is in what they call the club. You wonder about how common this is in the real world. And I did a lot of real-world research. I tend to research things extensively. There's a man in Denmark who has 550 children that he's fathered. 550 young men and young women in this small community, small country, are all related. Which causes a lot of problems. They've launched a legal action. He is no longer allowed to make donations to have any more than the 550 that are there. And the premise behind the club that people may want to meet, they do want to meet. All across the world, these gatherings are happening. You're seeing an image from one of these gatherings. There were 19 of them, all around the same age, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, who found out they had the same father. They got together and met their father, but also spent the weekend together. They had a whole lot of things in common. This became the club. Now, people ask, where do stories come from? And they come from a wide variety of places. Question, where did this story come from? Oh, I'm going to do the review first. A strong, accessible, and relevant story about modern families. That's a great review from Kirkus. Here's where the story came from. My friend Erica, and actually, my wife was the bride, it was the flower girl at her parents' wedding, got this Facebook message. Hi, Erica. My name is Brian. I'm reaching out to you because I'm a passionate musician, vocalist, and composer who has devoted my life to music. 
With that said, it's very apparent that we share a natural passion for music. What we also share is something that makes this coincidence even more fascinating to me. DNA. I'm in fact your little brother. Can you imagine getting this message on your computer? How would you respond? Here's how Erica responded. Wow, this is fascinating. Glad to hear from you. I would be happy to me if you want to. I look forward to hearing back from you. What a lovely response. That's me on the left. That's Erica in the middle. And that's Brian. They met. They discovered they're not alone. And perhaps you heard a little bit more about how many of them there might be. This story has promoted some interest. It was recently, recently featured on CTV News. From strange to siblings, DNA testing unveils family connection and sparks musical collaboration. I think this is just amazing. And it actually may have sparked more than just interest in this one. And this musical collaboration, Erica and Brian both being talented musicians, was part of the decision for me to make this story have a musical component. There's some research that shows that many things are in your genetic pattern, including musical interest and musical ability. In some of these gatherings where people have never met, they find out they have so much in common. The book is called The Club. Now, I'm going to stop right now doing my presentation because I want to do something a little bit different. I want to give you a bonus added because that's what I always want to do. You know our host is Martha Martin. Um, I want to tell you about her and ask her to present a little bit. Martha is our host for today. She's an award-winning teacher librarian who recently retired after 32 and a half years of teaching. She's also the creator of Book Babe Teaching Guides and currently works as a freelance educational consultant for DC Books and Cormorant Books. And she's an author and she's going to tell you about her books. Take it away, Martha. Hi, Eric. Thank you for that. Uh, actually, you were instrumental in me writing these novels. Do you like the pun there? Because it's instrumental, you know, the club, musicians, etc. Yeah. So you told me I should write something little. Write an Orca Soundings for Andrew. He's a good guy. Uh, Andrew is the publisher of Orca Books, and he is a good guy. And Orca actually published my first novel, River Traffic, in 2016. And there you can see the cover of it up there. River Traffic is a young adult mystery geared to students in grade 7 and up, but also adult readers. And it's what's known as a high-low novel, which means it's written for reluctant readers. People who like cliffhanger chapters and plots that move in a straight line with lots of dialogue and action and not as much description. I like to call those quick reads. And River Traffic is set in my hometown of LaSalle, Ontario, which is located on the Detroit River across from Michigan. So we're a border community. And the Detroit River is really, really narrow. And it's also sprinkled with a lot of islands along its route. And that's what made LaSalle a perfect place for bad guys to smuggle liquor from Canada into the United States in the 1920s. These smugglers were known as rum runners, and some of you may have heard of Prohibition. That was what was going on at the time. Uh, there are still marinas all along the LaSalle shoreline left over from the smuggling days of those rum runners in the 20s. It's actually a pretty cool historical area. And the Detroit River plays a big part in the story. The main character of river traffic is a kid whose family still owns one of those marinas today. And here's a little tease for the plot of River Traffic, since you've invited me to share. Oh, and full disclosure, there's a little bit of romance thrown into. 16-year-old Tom Lefebvre is trying to hold his world together. His family's marina is struggling, his dad is full of secrets, and the quarterback of the football team hates his guts. When a huge yacht docks at Tom's marina, things look brighter, especially when he meets Kat, the daughter of the boat's owner. It's not long, however, before Tom starts to realize there's something more than history happening on the river. And if Tom can't figure out what it is in time, he just might be history too. So that is River Traffic. My second novel is a sequel to River Traffic called Mayan Murder. And this time Tom joins Kat for spring break in the part of Mexico known as the Mayan Riviera. Some of you may have been there. They're staying at a beautiful resort and doing all sorts of touristy things, having a great time, reconnecting. But as usual, trouble and danger tend to follow them. And as I said, the title of this one is Mayan Murder, and I can't say much more without giving away the plot, but obviously murder is part of it. 
And I can tell you that I based the story on real things that were happening when the book was written. And I did that with River Traffic too. I always think stories are more interesting when they're inspired by real people or events, which brings us back to the book we're celebrating today, the club. So now let's get back to the launch. Now I would love you to uh, welcome audience, the special guest of Erica Yost, as well as Eric, and hopefully Brian will manage to join us before we get too far along. Welcome, everybody, come on back. Thank you. I I'm sure Brian is somewhere in cyberspace trying to get in with us right now. This is one of those <laughs> wonderful things for every teacher, for everybody who's done a Zoom call or tried to do a virtual classroom, you know that these things happen. As computers re- Decide that they want to, yes. Click on and take over your screen for a minute. That was a good time. Thank you. So um, we have some questions in the Q&A. They've actually been putting them in the chat. I'll take them wherever. So I'm going to jump back and forth here. I do see a fabulous uh, first question from grade five in Unionville to Eric. What's your favorite book and why? My favorite book is a book I just finished writing the third draft of. It's called The Three Wolves. And it's about um, a family that um, finds three baby wolves and their mother's been killed by a car and raises them. And this story has a real specialness for me because the first story I ever wrote when I was, um, I guess I was nine years old in grade five, I called it The Three Wolves. And my teacher told me she thought I could be a writer when I grew up, which was, of course, ridiculous since I was going to be in the NBA. So I've taken that title, six lines from that original story, and put them in there. And in the teacher's guide, your students will be able to see the story I wrote when I was nine years of age. It's uh, 13 pages of type, and I spelled the word wolves wrong every time. Um, W-O-L-F-S, and there was no spell check back then. The question is, do you know how to spell wolves now, Eric? Um, yes, <laughs> I do. That's progress, my friend. That's progress. It is. It is. <laughs> so we have a question uh well, first, we have a comment from Colchester North, which is a school that uh, I have been recently visiting, and they would like you to know that they love your books. So That's shout out to Colchester good. North and the crew there under the fabulous Mrs. McMullen principal. Uh, we have another question. I don't know who this is from, but how much do you spend on making books? Well, I spend a lot of time. And part of the time is because I really do a lot of research. So for this book, part of my research was getting to know Eric and Brian and their story, which was pretty spectacular way. Um, research is so important. Most books take me uh, at least first draft 60 days, but every novel you write six or seven or eight or nine times. How many times did you write your first novel, Martha? Uh, let's see. I think I did a an outline and then I did a draft and then I did some edits but I, I was writing a very short book. So my very first book that was not published is quite huge. And I have done three versions of that. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Erica. Erica, you and Brian had quite, quite a journey through this whole process. And can you describe your feelings on the day that you received that message from Brian? Well, yeah, it was uh, in the morning and I saw the message had been written it two in the morning or something. I guess he's a night owl. Um, I was surprised, um, but actually, as I read the message, to be honest, I was confused because he didn't put the part where I'm, I am, in fact, your little brother until like the second page that I saw. And so he's this amazing musician and I'm like, yeah, that's great. You sound like a cool guy, but why are you messaging me? But then it was, it was evident. Yeah, I knew that my father had done a series of sperm donations in the 80s and that potentially there were younger uh, half siblings out there somewhere, um, but I'd never heard from one before. So I was like, oh, oh my goodness, and one's a musician. How cool is that? So you weren't completely thrown at least, because I can no, imagine if you had no idea, it would have absolutely... It would have been a shock or... You kind of wonder, is this person telling the truth? You know, you have to be careful about these people messaging you after all. But um, I knew that, it, you know, it was a definite possibility that there were half siblings out there. Um, and then I just looked at his picture and it was like, that's my dad when I was a little girl. No. Oh, that's awesome. It was really so, yeah, good old yes, it was fun. 
Yeah. Social media allowing us to research, like Eric said in his presentation, there's no such thing as anonymous donors anymore because it, there's just so many ways that we can find each other. That's a great story. That's it. Yeah. Um, it's funny that, that TV interview that was done apparently after that uh, aired on CTV News, Brian was contacted by somebody else, another potential uh, half sibling. Yes. Yes. At, le at least gained in the email is one thing. I hear people continually have knocks on their door. And somebody says, hi, my name is so-and-so, you're my father, or you're my aunt, or you're my sibling. Can you imagine the knock on the door? Yeah, no. that would be weird. Now that, I don't know if i trust, right? It depends, you know, they'd have to show some evidence, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But he had the DNA test done, and, and luckily he really does look a lot like my dad, so. <laughs> it's such, a, such an unusual follow up to this and Eric no wonder you were inspired to write a story about it because it is really an interesting interesting whole topic lots to discuss there um Eric Julia Pierce would like to know what are the books called that you wrote about three or four boys written from each boy's perspective part of the problem with asking me about any of my books is is maybe I don't know the answer because I can't remember <laughs> um I, I think that that might be the seven sirs we're talking about which were written from seven um siblings perspectives i only wrote one of those the others were written by ted stanton and richard scrimger uh, shane peacock john wilson shane and norm mcclintock and sigmund yeah they're they're just interesting books and different perspectives are are fascinating to to write from um you know just jumping back a little about people knocks on doors and things one of the things that we talked about erica and brian and i is that we're really hopeful that through the the newspaper and the tv articles and through this book there'll be a normalization of this the last line I read was that these kids felt like they were a science experiment or freaks. This is just another way families are formed. And why I think Brian has said, I wish he was here to join us today, is how good he is that this is being normalized, that people who go through this sort of um, family formation, they're just, they're, they're just families. It's just another way families are formed. And there's nothing, um, nothing wrong with it. It's just a little unusual. It doesn't make it bad. No, I like that you're actually normalizing this. I think it's a great, uh, a great thing. Uh, Catherine Khan, Ken, would like to ask, do you face any challenges throughout the process of writing? She's contacting us from Lincoln Centennial Public School under the District School Board of Niagara. I've been down that board a lot. Actually, when I see the different schools, I, I've been in a lot of these schools. Um, for me, the, the difficulty is time, to find the time to write. There's so many stories and so little time. And um, I just... I don't know if there are challenges as much as joys. What happens with students, and being a teacher, I know this, is they often don't know what to write about. And I say to them, just look around. Story ideas are everywhere, like miracles are everywhere. And then you've got to do your planning. When you go on holidays with your parents, they don't say, come on, get in the car, we're leaving. Does anyone know where the car is parked? Does anyone know where the keys are? Can anyone drive? Where are we going? Who's going with us? Um, how long are we gone for? I'm a, a planner. I plot my stories out. I have an idea where they're going to go. And because I plan, I don't get caught in writer's block. I find the, the story is just a joy to, to be writing it. Just a joy. Uh, you have another question from Catherine, which is interesting, given that you just said that. She wanted to know how long it took you to write the club. First draft, probably 60 days. And then uh, I think that what you'll see when you uh, purchase a club is probably the seventh draft, including the original draft. Then a second one, then i uh, tell you a secret. My wife is the person that reads them after my second draft because I have some fairly severe learning disabilities. And so spelling is hard for me, as is um, tenses. So she reads them. And then at that point, I know Erica also read it. I like to have outside consultants or I call them beta readers. But with her, it was important that she got a chance to read it. Then I make the changes that I send to the editor who wants me to change it at least two or three times. So the first 60 days to write it becomes um, a year before it's finally ready. I'm really glad you talked about your significant learning challenges, because I think that um, is something that our student participants need to recognize, that you can be a writer even if you can't spell, even if you struggled as a student in reading. Um, that's one reason why you've written nine, I think, that I know of, nine high-low books. Um, why it's so important to write books that all students can read and everybody can be a writer. Don't give up on that option. We all have we all have learning disabilities. Like we all have um, allergies to different things. 
I, I always talk about you've got to not look at what you can't do, but what you can do. That's what defines you. No one goes to LeBron James and says, LeBron, you are a terrible ballet dancer. Yeah, she's probably a pretty good ballet dancer if you want to be. But it's not what he can't do that defines him as a person. We've got to look beyond our disabilities and find what we do well and do it well. Interesting enough, Rosina Curry wanted to know if there's a particularly quote, uh, sorry, a particular quote that speaks to your heart that you use as a mantra. And I feel like that sounds like a really good one that you just shared. There are so many words that inspire me on a daily basis. I also get inspired by music. I start the day often with a song that will move me beyond. And sometimes it's Lovely Day, um, a song called Lovely Day, or You Make My Life a Better Thing. I just like to pump myself up with music. And um, a, a saying that I remember years ago was, uh, my regrets are not for the things I tried and failed, but for the things I failed to try. You gotta go and try to do things. And if you fall down, it's okay, just get up again. No one's gonna think any worse of you if you try something and, and can't do it, doesn't make you a failure. It just means you do this right and you learn from failures. In education, we like to call that having a growth mindset. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Uh, interestingly enough, um, an anonymous attendee would like to know which book was the most difficult, sorry, difficult for you to write and why? The King of Jam Sandwiches might have been the hardest for me to write. Um, it's very personal. It's about my life growing up and it's about growing up in abject poverty. Um, with family, mental health issues, and moving forward. Uh, there's a, a line in the book where the, the young man basically says he knows he has to get up earlier than everybody every day and work harder and longer than everyone else if he wants to get somewhere in life. And I still live by that. I work hard. You do work hard. You are probably one of the hardest working writers I know and definitely one of the most prolific uh, you you have written a lot of books and they're all fabulous, frankly. Uh, so Catherine Chaff, Chaffee Chaff would like to know, is Harmony from the King of Jam Sandwiches based on a real person? Since you just brought up King of Jam Sandwiches, I'll let you handle that. Um, the answer is yes. And the next question is, no, I won't tell you. Uh, but if you're interested more about Harmony, I've got a book coming out next year called Finding Harmony, which gives her backstory right up to the point that she enters into the king of jam sandwiches. Uh, I love Harmony. She's um, she's that person who won't quit no matter what. They're the people I admire and work in, in life, those who just keep coming. And I say to kids, everyone that's listening today, everyone I've ever met will fail in life repeatedly and miserably a number of times. It, it, we all fail. Don't be afraid of it. Just... Pick yourself back up and keep moving. Fall down nine times, get up nine times, you're still winning. Harmony would never quit. Oh. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, at this stage of your career, do you still encounter challenges in finding willing publishers? It's become um, more difficult because there are less publishers in the world and they're, they're very specific what they're looking for. I, I've got... Um, had three books out last year, three books out two years ago, three books out three years ago, three books this year, three books next year, four books the year after that. Um, I, I, I'm okay with publishers, but it has become harder because there's less publishers publishing less books. Um, we have somebody asking, uh, are there colors that you like to use most for your picture books? That's Julia Pierce asking that. I, I don't get to pick. I'm not an illustrator. Um, the illustrators um, get to do that. And so I was, I've worked with brilliant people, including Eugenie Fernandez. And one of the newest picture books, which is called Not So Soon, Big Baboon, is going to be illustrated by the amazing Suzanne Del Rizzo, who's going to use plasticine art, which I'm looking forward to tremendously. I love her work. Uh, what was your inspiration to write Camp X? Camp X is based on a real place, Whitby, Ontario, the biggest spy base in North America. And the character in that book... Um, Little Bill is based on a real person, William Stevenson, man called intrepid, uh, quiet Canadian, although you probably know him as something else, James Bond. James Bond is based on this Canadian who was licensed to kill William Stevenson. I want people to know about Canadian heroes. If you don't know great people came from this country, how do you know that greatness is within you? That's very true. Um, Erica, throwing this back to you. What did you think when you first heard 
that Eric was going to write a story inspired by your experiences? Uh, well, honored for sure. Um, it was, yeah, I hadn't thought about it, that it would appeal to other people. For me, it's sort of my own story that I found more family than I knew about and, and sharing the music. But yeah, when I thought about it, of course other people would be interested. And, and uh, like Brian has always said, he, I guess he found, Brian found out that he was uh, a donor child um, when he was about 14. And so he was curious about it ever after. But some of his friends just said, oh, that's so weird. And even after he had met me and a couple of the other siblings, um, half siblings, um, people were sort of, well, th but they're not your family, you know? So some people thought it was cool. Others just said, oh, but they're strangers. Why would you want to spend time with them? So they seemed uncomfortable. So he was really happy actually when he heard Eric was writing this book because that's how families are made. It, it is one of the, the ways that people come into the world. And it doesn't have to be weird. It can be really positive. I mean, that's not to say we'll, we'll love all our siblings to bits, you know. The other ones that we've met, we have something in common, but not quite so much. And, you know, they're nice people. I'm, I'll certainly see them again. But Brian and I have developed really quite a close relationship. And it's a great thing. I know some of our audience members have siblings and they would agree with you that they don't always like their full siblings. So. No, exactly. <laughs> Let's you be never honest. Know what yes. you're going to get, right? So, especially the children. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you tend to like them better when you're an adult, kids. Just so you know, they stop irritating you quite as much when you don't have to share a bathroom with them or live with them. Uh, okay, Eric, do we have time for another couple of questions or not? What do you think? Let's do two more fast ones. We'll go from there. How's that? Sound? Okay, Colchester North would students would like to know which book took you the longest to write, and what are your top five books that you've written? Longest was um, End of Days. And I don't have a top five at all. I don't. After 135, it's not surprising you can't really rate them. Somebody did ask um, about how many books you've written, but I responded for you because I knew that we had mentioned that in the uh, in the presentation earlier. And um, this is interesting. What made you want to write stories? Now, you did talk about your students, but is there some bigger element to that? I've always liked writing. I've enjoyed it. Um, basically, what I found is it was a lot of fun, and they pay me money. And it's like if you can find something you love to do and it pays well and it's not illegal, you should continue to do it. I I love the fact that people I've never met can be inspired to have their lives changed by some words that I scribble on a piece of paper. It, it's so rewarding to have people tell me what the books mean to them. And even today, I've been looking through the chat and seeing schools that I know and knowing that right now, as I'm sitting in my basement, I'm talking to schools in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec. They're all represented here. Isn't that a little bit of magic? Yeah, definitely. Uh I know we said two more, but two people are asking the same question. And I think it's going to be a very quick answer. Which book was most enjoyable for you to write? The one I'm kind of the one yeah. I'm writing. <laughs> Whatever one you're on at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, we would love to share some information with you, though. You have the opportunity today to buy a personalized autograph copy of the club through Cormorant Books, our sponsor for today's virtual launch. As a special offer, we're also making available Eric's book made for you as well, which you heard about a little little bit ago. Prices include tax, so this is a great deal. And we've created order forms that you can download on the link where you first registered for this um, workshop. It's called an Eventbrite page, so that's where you'd be able to find that. But we've also made the order form available right in the webinar in the chat. So you can actually find the link there. Teachers, we're going to encourage you to combine orders of books for your, or sorry, orders from your students because free shipping is offered if there are 10 or more books. So that is actually an amazing opportunity. Uh, you can see the order form for more information about ordering, but also about the shipping charges because there are specific shipping charges mentioned in that. I want to thank Erica uh, today for being our special guest and sharing her story with us. Thanks to the Cormorant team, Sarah Jensen and Faye and Sarah Cooper and Barry and 
a host of other people I'm probably forgetting, uh, as well as Mark, for hosting today's virtual launch and providing us with this opportunity to meet. A big thanks to Eric for once again providing a great read for all of us, and a special thanks to all of you for joining us today from your schools and your homes. We've had a fabulous time, and we hope you have had one too. Thanks for joining, and have a great rest of your day. Eric, anything to add? Yes, I just want to mention that the books will not just be signed, but personalized to the students. I'm going to go down to Cormorant's office and personalize them for every student. And Martha, I want to thank you for generously hosting this. Thank you all. Everyone, have a fantastic day. Take care.